Greeting. I hope that you and your loved ones are in the best of health and in good cheer amid these trying times caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This recording is created for the benefit of my second year JMC College of Law students to supplement the review of the first exam on the rules on civil procedure. In this recording, I shall be discussing jurisdiction as it relates to civil cases. Again, kindly be reminded that this is merely a review and as such, the discussions herein are not comprehensive. And with that, let us begin. What is jurisdiction? How is jurisdiction defined? In the case of Mitsubishi Motors versus Bureau of Customs, GR number 209830, June 17, 2015, the Honorable Supreme Court had the opportunity to define jurisdiction as the power and authority of a court to hear, try, and decide a case. Likewise, in the case of Makasait versus People, GR number 156, 747, February 23, 2005, the Supreme Court defined jurisdiction as the power and authority to hear and determine a cause or the right to act in a case. Moreover, it should be noted that in Salvador versus Patricia Incorporated, GR number 195834, November 9, 2016, the Supreme Court expressly held that jurisdiction includes the power to determine whether or not it has the authority to hear and determine the controversy presented and the right to decide whether or not the statement of facts that confer jurisdiction exists, as well as other matters that arise in the case legitimately before the court. Precisely, jurisdiction does not only mean the power of the court to hear, try, and decide the case, but also the power to determine whether or not it has such power. All right, let us proceed to some classifications of jurisdiction. First is original jurisdiction. Original jurisdiction is defined as the power of the court to take judicial cognizance of a case instituted for judicial action for the first time, for the first time, under the conditions provided by law. It means jurisdiction to take cognizance of a cause at its inception. At its inception. Try it and pass judgment upon the law and the facts. Now, corollary there too. Appellate jurisdiction provides that it is the power of a court higher in rank to review, again, to review the final order or judgment of a, of a lower court and accordingly modify, reverse sustain or remand the same. General jurisdiction is defined as the power to adjudicate all controversies which may be brought before it within the legal bounds of rights and remedies except those expressly withheld from its plenary powers. Now, an example of this is the regional trial court which has general jurisdiction. Another classification is limited jurisdiction. What does that mean? Limited jurisdiction is defined as the power which is confined to particular causes or which can only be exercised under the limitation and circumstances prescribed by statute. This may be also known as special jurisdiction. Another classification is Exclusive jurisdiction, which is defined as the power to adjudicate a controversy to the exclusion of all other courts at that stage and precludes the idea of coexistence. In relation thereto, classification of jurisdiction as to concurrent jurisdiction, which is defined as the power conferred upon different courts, whether of the same or different ranks to take judicial cognizance at the same stage of the same case in the same or different judicial territories. But once the court assumed jurisdiction of a case, its jurisdiction shall continue until the case is finished. And lastly, delegated jurisdiction, 
the power conferred upon a court to hear and determine certain cases, such as cadastral and land registration, under certain conditions. An example of this delegated jurisdiction is that of the Municipal Trial Court, to hear and decide cadastral and land registration cases, where, first, there is no controversy over the land, Second, in case of contested land, the value does not exceed 100,000. What is the significance of this? The significance of this is that the Municipal Trial Court is treated as the same case as, or in the same manner as it is like the Regional Trial Court. And as such, the decision of the Municipal Trial Court in these cases in cadastral and land registration cases where the requirements of the law are complied with or requirements of the rules are complied with, the decision of the Municipal Trial Court is appealable to the Court of Appeals as it is treated as, the, as a regional trial court in these types. Now, question. Is the term jurisdiction synonymous with the term venue? Obviously, the answer is no. How then do we distinguish jurisdiction from venue? First decision, as we have discussed earlier, jurisdiction is the authority of a court to hear, try, and decide a case. While venue is the place or the geographical location where the action must be instituted and tried. Second decision, as provided for, in the case of Consolidated Bank and Trust Company versus IAC 198 SCRA 3442-1991, the Supreme Court held that jurisdiction is a matter of substantive law while venue is a procedural or adjective law. Third distinction. Third distinction. Jurisdiction is conferred by law or the Constitution. And as espoused by the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Santos III versus Northwest Orient Airlines, GR number 101538, June 22, 1992, jurisdiction cannot be conferred by the consent of the parties or by their failure to object to the lack of it. While, on the other hand, venue may be conferred by the act or agreement of the parties as expressly provided in Rule 4, Section 3 of the Revised Rules on Civil Procedure. And finally, in the case of NOCUM versus TAN, GR number 145022, September 23, 2005, the Supreme Court expressly held that jurisdiction creates a relation between the court and the subject matter, while venue creates a relation between the parties to the action. Now, relevant to our discussion are the so-called aspects of jurisdiction, which are, first, jurisdiction over the subject matter, second, jurisdiction over the parties, and who are the parties in civil cases? The plaintiff and the defendant. So, jurisdiction over the plaintiff and jurisdiction over the defendant. Third, Jurisdiction over the issues. And lastly, jurisdiction over the rest or thing involved in the litigation. I will discuss these individually in detail later. But first, perhaps it would be more prudent to answer the question. How does the court acquire jurisdiction? Well, obviously, this calls for a decision. If what is being referred to is jurisdiction over the plaintiff or petitioner, the one who initially filed the complaint, jurisdiction over the person of the plaintiff or petitioner is acquired by the filing of the complaint or other appropriate pleading before the court. Also class, I should emphasize that if the question in my exam or in the bar exams involves a query as to whether the court has jurisdiction over a particular person, Determine first whether this person is the plaintiff or the defendant. And if it is the plaintiff, then upon the filing of the complaint, the court acquires jurisdiction over his or her person. 
do not get confused. Sometimes the question is referring to whether the court acquires jurisdiction over the plaintiff. And you will be discussing whether there was a valid service of summons, etc. Taas na kayo inyong, pang inyong tubag. That is incorrect. That is referring to the defendant. Take note of this. Now, the second one. How is the court or how can the court acquire jurisdiction over the person of the defendant or respondent? Jurisdiction over the person of the defendant or respondent is obtained by the service of summons or other coercive process upon him or by his voluntary appearance or submission to the authority of the court. We will discuss this more in detail when we go to jurisdiction over the parties. Third, how, is, how can the court acquire jurisdiction over the subject matter of the claim? Jurisdiction over the subject matter of the claim is conferred by law. By the filing of the complaint or other initiatory pleading, the jurisdiction of the court thereof is invoked or called into activity. And it is this that the court acquires jurisdiction over said subject matter or nature of the action. Again, I would also discuss this more in detail when we go to jurisdiction over the subject matter. Fourth, how does the court acquire jurisdiction over the issues of the case? Jurisdiction over the issues of the case is determined and conferred by the pleadings filed in the case by the parties or by their agreement in a pretrial order or stipulation or at times by their implied consent as the failure of a party to object to evidence on an issue not covered by the pleading as provided in Section 5, Rule 10 of the Rules of Court. Fifth, how does the court acquire jurisdiction over the rest or the property or thing which is the subject of litigation? This is acquired by the actual or constructive seizure by the court of the thing in question, thus putting it in custodial edges. For example, in attachment or garnishment. Or by provision of law which recognizes in the court the power to deal with the property or subject matter within its territorial jurisdiction. For example, in land registration proceedings or cases which involve civil status or real property in the Philippines of a non-resident defendant. And lastly, how can the court acquire jurisdiction over the case or action? Jurisdiction over the case or action is acquired upon payment of the prescribed docket fee. But it's, it is settled that while the court acquires jurisdiction over any case only upon payment of the prescribed docket fee, its non-payment at the time of the filing of the complaint or the insufficient payment of the docket fees without intention to defraud the government does not automatically cause the dismissal of the complaint provided that the fees are paid within a reasonable period. Again, I will discuss this along with the cases of Manchester and Sun Life Insurance a little now let us proceed to the first aspect of jurisdiction, which is jurisdiction over the subject matter. Now how is jurisdiction over the subject matter defined? What is jurisdiction over the subject matter? Black's Law Dictionary expressly provides that jurisdiction over the subject matter is the power of a particular court to hear the type of case that is then before it. Jurisdiction over the subject matter also refers to the jurisdiction of the court over the class of cases to which a particular case belongs. Now, question class. What is the effect of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter? The general rule is that proceedings conducted or decisions made by a court are legally void where there is an absence of jurisdiction over the subject matter. Again, where lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter appears on the record, an appellate court may, on its own initiative, dismiss the action. It must be emphasized that it is the duty of the court to dismiss an action whenever it appears that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. Precisely in the case of Bureau of Customs versus De Venadera, GR number 193253, September 8, 2015, the Supreme Court held that even if the question of jurisdiction over the subject matter was not raised by either of the parties, as a general rule, the courts will have first to address such question before delving into the procedural and substantive issues of the case. And accordingly, dismiss the same if it appears that the court has no jurisdiction 
over the subject matter. It should be underscored class that jurisdiction over the subject matter is conferred by law. That is, jurisdiction over the subject matter is determined exclusively by the Constitution and the law. And as such, jurisdiction over the subject matter, this is very important class, cannot be conferred by the voluntary act or agreement of the parties. It cannot be acquired through or waived, enlarged, or diminished by the acts or omissions of the parties. Nor, nor can jurisdiction over the subject matter be conferred by the acquiescence of the court. Precisely, this matter being a matter of substantive law and legislative in character. Another query class. How is jurisdiction over the subject matter determined? So we have discussed earlier that it is conferred by law, either by the constitution or by enacted statute by the legislature. Now, how is jurisdiction determined if it is conferred by law? It is well settled class that while jurisdiction is conferred by law, jurisdiction is determined by the allegations in the complaint as well as by the character or the relief sought. In order to determine whether the court has jurisdiction over a particular or jurisdiction over the subject matter, in a particular case, you, may, you merely examine the allegations in the complaint and the relief sought in the said complaint. Precisely, the allegations in the complaint and the character of, re character of the relief sought determine both the nature of the action and the jurisdiction of the court. Now, question class. Question. Does the court, or is it required that the court determine the truth of the allegations of the complaint in order to determine whether or not it has jurisdiction of the case? Generally, no. No. Another question, class. Does the defenses and the evidence given by the parties or by the defendant, does it determine jurisdiction over the subject matter? In the case of Indofil Textile Mills versus Adviento, GR number 171-212, August 14, 2014, the Supreme Court held that the settled rule is that jurisdiction over the subject matter is based on the allegations in the initiatory pleading, which is the complaint. Jurisdiction of the court cannot be made to depend upon the defenses made by the defendant in his answer or in his motion to dismiss. This is very clear, Krasa. This is very clear. All right, query class. When can jurisdiction be questioned or otherwise stated? In which stage of the proceeding can jurisdiction be questioned or objected to? Now, prior to answering this, it must first be established that the court may motu proprio or on its own initiative dismiss the case for lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, even without any objection from the defendant. Now, as to the question or as to the query, in which stage of the proceeding can jurisdiction over the subject matter be objected to? The answer is, as a general rule, the defense of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter may be raised at any stage of the proceeding, even for the first time on appeal. As a matter of fact, as I have mentioned earlier, the court may motu proprio or on its own motion dismiss a complaint at any time when it appears from the pleadings or the evidence on record that lack of jurisdiction exists. However, this is the general rule. There is an exception. And by way of exception is the doctrine of estopel by laches, which was enunciated by the Honorable Supreme Court in the case of Tijam versus Tibung Hanoi. Precisely, the Honorable Supreme Court Applied the doctrine of estopel by laches in the case of Tijam versus Sibong Hanoi, GR number L-21450. In this case, the Supreme Court barred a belated objection to jurisdiction that was raised by a party only when an adverse decision was rendered by the lower court against it and because it raised the issue only after almost 15 years and after seeking affirmative relief from the court and actively participating in all stages of the proceeding. 
However, class, it is my submission that being merely the exception to the general rule, the doctrine of estopel by laches, as was mentioned earlier, should be construed strictly. Now, what does this mean? This means that the factual antecedent, as provided in the case of Tijam versus Sibung Hanoi, must be present in order to confer jurisdiction over the subject matter through estopel by laches. That is, that the issue of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter was raised by a party only when an adverse decision was rendered by the lower court, and that the party questioning said jurisdiction participated in each and every stage of the proceedings and raised the issue of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter after almost 15 years. All right, let us proceed to the relevant doctrines concerning jurisdiction. Take note, class, that these doctrines have been repeatedly asked in the previous bar examinations in one form or another. Let's begin with the doctrine of judicial stability or non-interference. The Supreme Court, in the case of Barroso versus Omelio, GR number 194767, October 14, 2014, expressly stated, that the doctrine of judicial stability or non-interference in the regular orders or judgments of a co-equal court enunciate the rule that no court can interfere by injunction with the judgments or orders of another court of concurrent jurisdiction, having the power to grant the relief sought by the injunction. This simply means, class, that courts of equal and coordinate jurisdiction cannot interfere with each other's orders. By way of example class, a certain regional trial court cannot issue an injunction to enjoin or stop a proceeding of another regional trial court. Also, this principle likewise bars a court from reviewing or interfering with a judgment of a co-equal court over which it has no appellate jurisdiction or power of review. However, class, it should be noted that the doctrine of judicial stability or non-interference in the regular orders or judgment of a co-equal court is not absolute. The rules of court expressly provides for some exceptions. The first one is, other than the court in which the action is pending, the RTC of the place where the deposition, deposition is being taken may order the officer conducting the examination to cease forthwith from taking the deposition or may limit the scope and manner of the taking of the deposition. This is provided under Section 16 of Rule 23. Another exception is provided for under Rule 39, Section 16, when a third party or a stranger to the action asserts a claim over the property levied upon. The claimant may vindicate his claim by an independent action in the proper civil court which may stop the execution of the judgment on property not belonging to the judgment debtor. And lastly, although not specifically included in the Rules on Civil Procedure, we will just mention it here, under Section 14, Rule 126 of the Revised Rules of Criminal Procedure, a search warrant issued by a court may be quashed by a co-equal court when the criminal case is subsequently instituted in the latter court and the motion to quash was not resolved by the court issuing the same. All right, let us proceed to another important doctrine, which is the doctrine of adherence of jurisdiction. And the doctrine of adherence of jurisdiction provides that when a court has already obtained jurisdiction over a controversy, its jurisdiction to proceed to the final determination of the case is not affected by new legislation transferring jurisdiction over such proceedings to another tribunal. Precisely, in the case of Heirs of Tungan versus Santa Lucia Realty and Development Incorporated, GR number 231737, March 6, 2018, the Supreme Court categorically held that once vested by the allegations in the complaint, Jurisdiction over the subject matter also remains vested up to the end of litigation, irrespective of whether or not the plaintiff is entitled to recover upon all or some of the claims asserted therein. 
However, the rule on adherence of jurisdiction is not absolute. There are some exceptions. The first exception is when the change is juri in jurisdiction is curative in character. And second, when a newly enacted statute changing the jurisdiction of the court is given retroactive effect. All right. Another doctrine is the doctrine of hierarchy of court. Now, what does this doctrine provide? In the case of Quezon, PC, PTCA Federation Incorporated versus Department of Education, GR number 188720, February 23, 2016, the Honorable Supreme Court held that in cases where remedy is available in the lower courts in the exercise of their original or concurrent jurisdiction, party litigants should not disregard the hierarchy of courts by seeking relief directly to the higher court. The Supreme Court reiterates the judicial policy that it will not entertain direct resort to it unless the redress desired cannot be obtained in the appropriate courts or where exceptional and compelling circumstances justify availment of a remedy within and calling for the exercise of its primary jurisdiction. In relation thereto, the hierarchy of courts serves as the general determinant of the appropriate forum for such petition. The established policy is that petitions for the issuance of extraordinary writs against first level or inferior courts should be filed with the regional trial court and those against the latter with the court of appeals and direct invocation of the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction to issue the extraordinary writs should be allowed only when there are special and important reasons, therefore, clearly and specifically set out in the petition. Now, class, this simply, this simply means that the doctrine of hierarchy of court provides that where courts have concurrent jurisdiction over a subject matter, a case must be filed before the lowest court possible having the appropriate jurisdiction. Except if, if one can advance a special reason which would allow direct recourse to a higher court. Basically, an example of this class is where you file an extraordinary writ of writ of pit or a petition for the issuance of the writ of certiorari, prohibition or mandamus against the orders or judgment of a municipal trial court. Okay. The regional trial court, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court has concurrent jurisdiction over those actions or those petitions for the issuance of those extraordinary writs. Under the doctrine of judicial hierarchy, you file it with the lowest court possible, which is the regional trial court. However, there are several exceptions to the rule on hierarchy of court which will not prevent the High Court from assuming and exercising its primary jurisdiction when any of the following grounds are present. The first, first ground or first exception is when genuine issues of constitutionality are raised that must be addressed immediately. Second, when the case involves transcendental importance. Third, when the case is novel or the crucial issues submitted for resolution are of first impression. Fourth, when the constitutional issues raised are better decided by the Supreme Court. Fifth, when time is of the essence. Sixth, when the subject of review involves acts of a constitutional organ. Seven, when there is no other plain, speedy, and adequate remedy in the ordinary course of law. Eighth, when the petition includes questions that may affect public welfare, public policy, or demanded by the broader interests of justice. Ninth, when the order complained of is a patent nullity. Tenth, when the appeal was considered as an inappropriate remedy. Eleven, when the court is confronted with cases of national interest and of serious implication. And lastly, when the exigency of the situation being litigated requires the court to assume jurisdiction. Question class. Does, is it necessary that all those exceptions must concur or occur? at the same time to justify a direct resort to the higher court? The answer is no. Any one, any one of these exceptions can justify direct resort to 
a higher court and serve as an exception to the doctrine of judicial hierarchy. An example of this class is a, the very known case, the very known case of Republic versus Sereno. Uh, you know this, Republic versus Sereno against Chief Justice Sereno. GR number 237-428, May 11, 2018. The Supreme Court said that direct resort to the Supreme Court is justified considering that the action for co-warranto questions the qualification of no less than a member of the court. The issue whether this person usurps, intrudes into, or unlawfully holds or exercises public office is a matter of public concern over which the government takes special interest. Let us proceed to the doctrine of primary jurisdiction. What does the doctrine of primary jurisdiction provide? In the case of heirs of Simeon Latayan versus Pan, GR number 201652, December 2, 2015, the Supreme Court held that the doctrine of primary jurisdiction precludes the courts from resolving a controversy over which jurisdiction was initially lodged with an administrative body of special competence. The doctrine does not allow a court to arrogate unto itself authority to resolve a controversy, the jurisdiction over which is initially lodged with an administrative body of special competence. Moreover, the doctrine of primary jurisdiction instructs that if a case is such that its determination requires the expertise, specialized training, and knowledge of an administrative body, relief must first be obtained in an administrative proceeding before resort to the court is had. Why is this? What is the reason for this? This is by reason of the special knowledge and expertise of administrative agencies over matters falling under their jurisdiction. Precisely, these administrative bodies of special knowledge and expertise are in a better position to pass judgment thereon. Thus, the findings of these administrative bodies or the findings of fact of these administrative bodies are generally accorded great respect, if not finality, by the court. This is a very simple class. It's very basic. If a case is properly within the jurisdiction of an administrative tribunal, having special knowledge and expertise, the courts generally refrain from taking cognizance of the said, of the said case under the doctrine of primary jurisdiction. Now, in relation to the doctrine of primary jurisdiction, is the doctrine of exhaustion of administrative remedies. Now, what does this particular doctrine provide? In the case of International Container Services Incorporated versus the City of Manila, GR number 185622, October 17, 2018, the Supreme Court held that the doctrine of exhaustion of administrative remedies requires recourse to the pertinent administrative agency before resorting to court action. The theory is that the administrative authorities are in a better position to resolve questions addressed to their particular expertise and that errors committed by subordinates in their resolution may be rectified by their superiors if given a chance to do so. Thus, it is a settled principle in administrative law that before a party can be allowed to resort to the courts, that said party is expected to have exhausted all means of administrative remedies available under the law. Precisely, where the enabling statute indicates a procedure for administrative review and provides a particular system of administrative appeal or reconsideration, the courts, for reasons of law, committee, and convenience, will not entertain a case unless the available administrative remedies have been resorted to. And in relation thereof, the party with an administrative remedy must not merely initiate the prescribed administrative procedure to obtain relief, but also pursue it to its appropriate conclusion. Well, basically, under the doctrine of exhaustion of administrative remedies, where a case has been lodged before a particular administrative tribunal, all remedies within the administrative framework, whether by reconsideration, 
or appeal to a higher office should be complied with before the aggrieved party may resort to the courts. However, it should be noted that the doctrine of exhaustion of administrative remedies is relative and is flexible, depending on the peculiarity and uniqueness of the factual and circumstantial setting of each case. And to that effect, there are several exceptions to the said doctrine, which are, first, when there is a violation of due process, second, when the issue involved is a purely legal question, third, when the administrative action is patently illegal, amounting to lack or excess of jurisdiction, fourth, when, the when there is estopel on the part of the administrative agency concerned, fifth, when there is irreparable injury, sixth, when the respondent is a department secretary who acts as an alter ego of the president, bears the implied and assumed approval of the latter. Seven, when to require exhaustion of administrative remedies would be unreasonable. Eight, when it would amount to a nullification of a claim. Nine, when the subject matter is a private land in a land case proceeding. Ten, when the rule does not provide a plain, speedy, and adequate remedy. Eleven, when there are circumstances indicating the urgency of judicial intervention. 12. When no administrative review is provided by law. 13. Where the rule of qualified political agency applies. And lastly, when the issue of non-exhaustion of administrative remedies has been rendered moot. All right, another doctrine that we will be discussing, although not that known, is the doctrine of ancillary jurisdiction. In the case of City of Manila versus Garcia Cuerdo, GR number 175-723, February 4, 2014, the Supreme Court held that while a court may be expressly granted the incidental powers necessary to effectuate its jurisdiction, a grant of jurisdiction in the absence of a prohibitive, prohibitive legislation implies, it implies the necessary and usual incidental powers essential to effectuate it and subject to existing laws and constitutional provisions, every regularly constituted court has power to do all things that are reasonably necessary for the administration of justice within the scope of its jurisdiction and for the enforcement of its judgment and mandate. What does this mean? This means that demand, matters, or questions ancillary or incidental to or growing out of the main action and coming within the above principles may be taken cognizance of by the court and determined. Since such jurisdiction is in the aid of its authority over the principal matter, even though the court may thus be called on to consider and decide matter which as original causes of action would not be within its cognizance. All right, let's proceed to jurisdiction over the parties. What is jurisdiction over the parties? Jurisdiction over the parties refers to the power of the court to make decisions that are binding on persons. It is the legal power of the court to render a personal judgment against a party to an action or proceeding. Now relevant to our discussion is the distinction between jurisdiction over the subject matter and jurisdiction over the parties. First distinction. Jurisdiction over the subject matter is defined or is conferred by law and determined by the allegations in the complaint and the character of the relief sought, while jurisdiction over the parties is acquired by the filing of the petition in the case of the plaintiff or by valid service of summons or voluntary submission to the court's authority in the case of the defendant. In jurisdiction over the subject matter, the same cannot be conferred by the agreement of the parties by contract, or by the party's silence or acquiescence. Basically, it cannot be waived. Jurisdiction over the parties can, however, be subject to the will of the parties. Jurisdiction over the subject matter can be raised at any stage of the proceedings or questions as to jurisdiction over the subject matter can be raised at any stage of the proceedings, even on the first time on appeal. However, jurisdiction over the parties is not raised as an affirmative defense in the answer, you cannot raise it for the first time on appeal. 
as I have said earlier, jurisdiction over the subject matter cannot be waived. However, obviously, jurisdiction over the parties is waivable if you do not include it in your affirmative defenses in the answer, okay, or if you do not include it in your answer. Now, question. How is jurisdiction over the parties acquired? How is it acquired? The question calls for a distinction. A distinction of whether or not the party is the plaintiff or the defendant. How then is jurisdiction over the plaintiff acquired? It is acquired as soon as he files his complaint or petition. Precisely because by the mere filing of the complaint, the plaintiff in a civil action voluntarily submits himself or herself to the jurisdiction of the court. How can the court acquire jurisdiction over the defendant? The court acquires jurisdiction over the defendant either by his voluntary appearance in the court and his submission to its authority or by a valid service of summons. Now, what do we mean by voluntary appearance of the defendant? Voluntary appearance simply means that the defendant asks for affirmative relief from the court by way of pleading or motion or any other affirmative relief that the defendant is asking before the court. Question. Question. Under Rule 14, Section 23 of the Revised Rules of Court, is the inclusion in a motion to dismiss of any other or of any grounds other than lack of jurisdiction of the person Shall it be deemed voluntary appearance? The answer is yes. The rule now is, as provided in Rule 14, Section 23 of the Rules of Court, the inclusion in a motion to dismiss of other grounds, aside from lack of jurisdiction over the person of the defendant, shall be deemed a voluntary appearance. However, class, you have to remember, you have to remember that there is no longer or the a motion to dismiss based on lack of jurisdiction over the person, the defendant, is already a prohibited motion. You can no longer file this. A motion to dismiss on the ground of failure to or failure to or failure of the court to acquire jurisdiction over the person, the defendant. Just take note of it and take note of Rule 14, Section 23. Again, as a general rule, if a defendant has not been properly summoned, the court acquires no jurisdiction over his or her person. And a judgment rendered against him or her or it is null and void. By way of exception, the defendant's voluntary appearance in the action shall be equivalent to service of summons. It should also be noted, class, that jurisdiction over the person of the defendant is required only in actions in persona, okay, or those actions which enforces or which seeks to enforce personal liability upon the person, the defendant. On the other hand, a, an action in REM or a proceeding in REM or quasi in REM, jurisdiction over the person, the defendant, is not a prerequisite to confer jurisdiction on the court, provided that the court acquires jurisdiction over the rest. However, as we will be discussing in Salmon, in the topic of Salmon, the requirement of service of Salmon upon the defendant in actions in rem and quasi in rem, although not required to acquire jurisdiction over his person, is required as part of due. All right, let us proceed to another aspect of jurisdiction, which is jurisdiction over the issues. How is this defined? This is defined as the power of the court to try and decide issues raised in the pleadings of the parties. Now, what is an issue? An issue is a disputed point or question to which the parties to an action have narrowed down their allegations upon which they are desirous of obtaining a decision. Now, basically, jurisdiction over the issues is conferred and determined by, first, the pleadings of the parties, 
which necessarily presents the issues to be tried and determine whether or not the issues are of factor of law. And second, by stipulation of the parties as when, in the pre-trial, the parties enter into stipulations of facts or enter into agreements simplifying the issues of the case. And lastly, by waiver or failure to object to evidence on a matter not raised in the pleading. Here, the parties try with their express or implied consent of issues not raised by the pleading. Now, let us go to the final aspect of jurisdiction, which is jurisdiction over the rest or property in litigation. Jurisdiction over the rest refers to the court's jurisdiction over the thing or the property which is the subject of the action. It must be remembered, class, that rest in civil law is a thing or object. It is everything that may form an object of right as opposed to a persona, which is the subject of right. It includes, it includes object, subject matter, or status. Question, how is jurisdiction of the rest acquired? First, by placing the property under it or under the court's custody or in custodial legis, or by seizure of the thing under legal process, whereby it is brought into actual custody of, the, of law, by statutory authority conferring upon the court the power to deal with certain property within the territorial jurisdiction. All right, let us proceed to jurisdiction of specific courts. Let us begin with jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls. The Supreme Court likewise has original jurisdiction over petitions for certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, habeas corpus, and quo warranto. The Supreme Court likewise has exclusive original jurisdiction for petitions for certiorari, prohibition, and mandamus against the Court of Appeal, the Commission on Election, the Commission on Audit, the Sandigan Bayan, and the Court of Tax Appeals, and Bank. All right. The Supreme Court has concurrent original jurisdiction with the Court of Appeals over cases for petitions for certiorari, prohibition, and mandamus against the Regional Trial Court, as provided in B Batasam Pambansam Bilang 129, against the Civil Service Commission, the Central Board of Assessment Appeal, the National Labor Relations Commission, or the NLRC, and other quasi-judicial agencies. However, it should be noted that although there is concurrent jurisdiction between the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, SCAM number 07-7-12 issued on December 2007 provides that if the petition involves an act or remission of a quasi-judicial agency, the petition shall only be cognizable by the Court of Appeals and must be filed there. The Supreme Court also has concurrent original jurisdiction with the Court of Appeals over petitions for it of Kalikasan. Moreover, the Supreme Court has concurrent original jurisdiction with the Court of Appeals and the Regional Trial Court over petitions for certiorari, prohibition, and mandamus against lower courts, which in this case is the Municipal Trial Court, petitions for quo warranto, and petitions for habeas corpus. The Supreme Court has concurrent original jurisdiction with the Regional Trial Court in cases affecting ambassadors, public ministers, and consuls, has original and concurrent jurisdiction with the Court of Appeals, the Regional Trial Court, and the Sandigan Bayan over petitions for writ of amparo and petitions for writ of habeas data. Let's proceed to the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court shall have the power to review, revise, reverse, modify, or affirm on appeal or certiorari as the law or the rules of court may provide final judgment and orders of lower courts in, first, all cases in which the constitutionality or validity of any treaty, international or executive agreement, law, presidential decree, proclamation order, instruction, ordinance, or regulation is in question, 
all cases involving the legality of any tax, imposed, assessment, or toll, or any penalty imposed in relation thereto, all cases in which a jurisdiction of any lower court is an issue, all criminal cases in which the penalty imposed is reclusion perpetual higher, all cases in which only an error of or question of law is involved. And by way of petition for review on certiorari under Rule 45 against judgments of the Court of Appeal, the Sandigan Bayan, the regional trial court, but there is a qualification where it only raises pure questions of law or cases and cases falling under Section 5, Article 8 of the Constitution. The Court of Tax Appeals in its decisions rendered and bank and the Municipal Trial Court in the exercise of their delegated jurisdiction, which, as was discussed earlier, involves cadastral or RAN registration proceedings under requisites as provided for under the law and the rules. However, it should be emphasized that appeals from quasi-judicial agencies, even if it is merely or only questions of law or only questions of law are involved may be brought to the CA under Rule 43 of the Rules of Court. This may be considered as an exception to the general rule that appeals on pure questions of law are brought to the Supreme Court. Again, class, the Supreme Court is not a trier of fact. Okay? All petitions raised before it as a general rule must raise only questions of law or purely questions of law. However, the Supreme Court itself has rendered several exceptions to this rule wherein they may resolve factual issues. And these exceptions are, first, the conclusion is grounded on speculation, surmises, or conjectures. Second, the inference is manifestly mistaken, absurd, or impossible. There is grave abuse of discretion. The judgment is based on a misapprehension of facts. The findings of facts are conflicting. There is no citation of specific evidence on which the factual findings are based. The finding of absence of facts is contradicted by the presence of evidence on record. The findings of the Court of Appeals are contrary to those of the trial court. The Court of Appeals manifestly overlooked certain relevant and undisputed facts that, if properly considered, would justify a different conclusion. The findings of the Court of Appeals are beyond the issues of the case. And lastly, or lastly, such findings are contrary to the admissions of both parties. All right, let's go to the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeals. Question class. Does the Court of Appeals have original jurisdiction? Or as its namesake suggests, it only has appellate jurisdiction. Obviously, the answer is it has original jurisdiction. And one of its, or its only exclusive original jurisdiction are those actions for annulment of judgment of the regional trial court. It has concurrent original jurisdiction with the Supreme Court for petitions for certiorari prohibition and mandamus against the Regional Trial Court, the Civil Service Commission, the Central Board of Assessment Appeals, and other quasi-judicial agencies mentioned in Rule 43, and the NLRC. Petitions for writs of Kalikasan with the Supreme Court and the Regional Trial Court. Petitions for certiorari, prohibition, and mandamus against lower court and bodies. Petitions for co-waranto, and petitions for writs of habeas corpus with the Supreme Court, Regional Trial Court, and Sandigan Bayan petitions for Erito Pamparo, and petitions for habeas data. The Court of Appeals has exclusive appellate jurisdiction by ordinary appeal from judgments of the RTC and Family Court over decisions of the Municipal Trial Court in cadastral and land registration proceedings pursuant to its delegated jurisdiction or the delegated jurisdiction of the MTC by way of petition for review 
from judgments of the regional trial court rendered in its appellate jurisdiction from decisions, resolutions, and orders of the Civil Service Commission, Civil Service Commission, and other bodies mentioned in Rule 43 or quasi-judicial body. However, you must remember, class, that the enumeration in Rule 43, Section 1, is not exclusive. As long as it is a quasi-judicial body exercising quasi-judicial quasi function, its decision may be appealed by petition for review under Rule 43 to the Court of Appeal. From decisions of the Office of the Ombudsman in administrative disciplinary cases class, you have to remember that the Office of the Ombudsman may render two, two types of decisions or two decisions. Okay? One is administrative or disciplinary cases gross misconduct, serious dishonesty, etc. And if you are not satisfied with the decision of the ombudsman in those types of cases, what is your remedy? Your remedy is Rule 43 with the Court of Appeals. Petition for review under Rule 43 with the Court of Appeals. However, if the decision of the Sandigan of the Office of the Ombudsman is whether or not there is or there is probable cause in criminal cases, then your remedy is not under Rule 43 as it is criminal in nature or it is non-administrative or non-disciplinary in nature. Your remedy is you, you file a petition for certiorari under Rule 65 with the Supreme Court class, not with the Court of Appeals, with the Supreme Court. Again, if, it is if the decision of the Ombudsman concerns administrative disciplinary cases your remedy is if you are the aggrieved party your remedy is you file a petition for review under rule 43 with the court of appeals if it is non-disciplinary or criminal in nature the decision of the office of the ombudsman for example a finding of probable cause or whether or not there is probable cause to file the remedy of the aggrieved party is not is not rule 43 under or Rule 43 with the Court of Appeals, but but Rule 65, petition for certiorari based on grave abuse of discretion amounting to lack of or excess of jurisdiction, not with the Court of Appeals, but with the Supreme Court. That is very clear, clear class. That is very clear. All right, how about jurisdiction or jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan? Uh, to abbreviate our discussion class, I will no longer discuss jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan because this is already covered by your subject in criminal procedure and most of the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan pertains to criminal cases. Since this is civil procedure, for purposes of brevity and to abbreviate our discussion, I will no longer discuss the jurisdiction of the Sandigan Bayan. All right. Let's proceed to the jurisdiction of regional trial court. Under BP 129, the regional trial court shall have exclusive original jurisdiction over all civil actions in which the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation. Now, how do we determine if a particular action is incapable of pecuniary estimation? This is answered by the Supreme Court in the case of Roldan versus Barrios, GR number. 214803 April 23 2018 citing Singsong versus Isabella Somil the Supreme Court had the occasion to rule that in determining whether an action is one the subject matter of which is not capable of pecuniary estimation the honorable court the honorable supreme court has adopted the criterion of first ascertaining the nature of the principal action or remedy sought if it is primarily for the recovery of sum of money the claim is considered capable of pecuniary estimation. And whether jurisdiction is in municipal trial courts or in the courts of first instance would depend on the amount of the claim. However, the basic issue is something other than the right to recover a sum of money where the money claim is purely incidental to or a consequence of the principal relief sought. This court has considered such actions as cases where the subject of the litigation may not be estimated in terms of money, 
and are cognizable exclusively by the courts of first instance. Now, regional trial court. And in the same case, the Supreme Court has provided some examples of those actions capable of pecuniary estimation. And these are those actions for specific performance, support, foreclosure of mortgage, annulment of judgment, actions questioning the validity of a mortgage, annulling a deed of sale or conveyance, and to recover a price paid and for rescission. Also, it should be emphasized that an expropriation suit is an action incapable of pecuniary estimation, precisely because it does not involve the recovery of sum of money, but the exercise by the government of its authority and right to take private property for public use. So, if the action is one capable of pecuniary estimation, you must first compute the jurisdictional amount. And the regional trial court has exclusive original jurisdiction if the amount involved exceeds 300,000 pesos outside Metro Manila or exceeds 400,000 pesos in Metro Manila in the following cases. Actions in admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. Matters of probate, the state or interstate, where the amount refers to gross value of a state. And in all other cases where the amount refers to the demand, exclusive of interest, damages, and whatever kind, of whatever kind, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, and costs. Again, class, in the computation of the jurisdictional amount, whether or not it exceeds 300,000 or it exceeds 400,000. As a general rule, you do not include in your computation the amount of interest, damages, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, and costs. However, if damages is the main cause of action or one of the main causes of action, obviously you include it in the computation for the determination of jurisdictional amount. Again, class, to repeat, if it is, if the jurisdictional amount is 300,000 outside of Metro Manila, then the regional trial court does not have jurisdiction over it because BP 129 states that if the amount involved exceeds 300,000 outside of Metro Manila, then the regional trial court has jurisdiction. Therefore, if it is 300,000 flat, then the regional trial court does not have jurisdiction over it. It must exceed 300,000 within Metro Manila. It must exceed 400,000 outside of or in Metro Manila. It must exceed 300,000 outside of Metro Manila. It must exceed 400,000 in Metro Manila. Also, the regional trial court has exclusive original jurisdiction over civil actions involving title to or possession of real property or any interest therein where the assessed value exceeds 20,000 pesos outside of Metro Manila or exceeds 50,000 pesos in Metro Manila. This is the general rule. However, if the action is forcible entry or unlawful detainer, then jurisdiction is properly lodged within the Municipal Trial Court, MCTC or METC. Again, those civil actions involving title to or possession of real property or an interest therein where the assessed value exceeds 20,000 pesos outside Metro Manila or exceeds 50,000 pesos in Metro Manila, the regional trial court has exclusive original jurisdiction. However, by way of exception, if the action is a forcible entry action or an unlawful detainer action, then the jurisdiction is properly lodged with the municipal trial court irrespective of the value of the real property. Now class, if the question in my exam or in the bar examinations is which court has jurisdiction, whether the regional trial court or the municipal trial court, you have to first determine the answers to these two questions. The first one is whether the action involves title to or possession of real property or any interest therein. And the determination, in the determination thereof, 
the ultimate objective test would be instructive. If the ultimate objective is for the recovery of the title to or possession of the real property or any interest therein, then the test of jurisdiction is the assessed value of the property, whether it exceeds 20,000 pesos outside of Metro Manila or 50,000 pesos within Metro Manila, except forcible entry and unlawful detainer cases where the municipal trial court has jurisdiction irrespective of the assessed value. Now, if the action does not involve title to or possession or possession of real property or any interest therein, then determine whether the action is capable or incapable of pecuniary estimation. If it is incapable of pecuniary estimation, then the regional trial court has jurisdiction over the action. If it is capable of pecuniary estimation, determine the jurisdictional amount. And in, the, and in the computation of the jurisdictional amount, do not include, as a general rule, IDELEC. What does IDELEC mean or stand for? Interest, damages, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, and costs. However, by way of exception, if damages is the main cause of action or one of the main causes of action, then you include damages in the computation of the jurisdictional amount. And as was Stated earlier, if the jurisdictional amount exceeds 300,000 pesos outside of Metro Manila, or if it, ex if it exceeds 400,000 pesos in Metro Manila, then the regional trial court has jurisdiction. Otherwise, the municipal trial court has jurisdiction over the action. The regional trial court likewise has original, exclusive, original jurisdiction over all civil actions and proceedings falling within ex the exclusive original jurisdiction of the Court of Agrarian Reform. All cases not within the exclusive jurisdiction of any court, tribunal, person, or body exercising judicial or quasi-judicial function. This jurisdiction of the RTC is often described as the general jurisdiction of the Regional Trial Court making it, as I have mentioned earlier, a court of general jurisdiction. The Regional Trial Court likewise has original exclusive jurisdiction over intracorporate controversies or those cases involving devices or schemes employed by or any acts of, bo of the Board of Directors, business associates, its officers or partnership amounting to fraud and misrepresentation which may be detrimental to the interest of the public and our stockholders, partners, members of associations, organizations registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Those controversies arising out of intra-corporate or partnership relations between and among stockholders, members or associates between any or all of them, and corporation, and the corporation, partnership, or association of which they are stockholders, members, or associates, respectively, and between such corporation, partnership, or association, and the state, insofar as it concerns their individual franchise or right to exist as such entity. Controversies in election or appointments of directors, trustees, officers, or managers of such corporations, partnerships, or associations, and petitions of corporations, partnerships, or associations to be declared in a state of suspension of payment in cases where the corporation, partnership, or association possesses sufficient property to cover all its debts but foresees impossibility of meeting them when they respectively fail or due or respectively fall due or in cases where the corporation, partnership, or association has no sufficient, has no sufficient asset to cover its liabilities but is under management of a rehabilitation receiver or management committee. The Regional Trial Court likewise or also has exclusive original jurisdiction over petitions for declaratory relief. Now let's proceed to the appellate jurisdiction of the Regional Trial Court. Now the Regional Trial Court shall have appellate jurisdiction over cases decided by lower courts in their respective ter territorial jurisdictions. The court being referred to here is the Municipal Trial Court, Municipal Circuit Trial Court, etc. 
except those made in the exercise of delegated jurisdiction, which are appealable in the same manner as decisions of the regional trial court. Now, the regional trial court also has special jurisdiction. Precisely, the Supreme Court may designate certain branches of the RTC to try exclusively criminal cases, juvenile and domestic relations cases, agrarian cases, urban land reform cases, not falling within the jurisdiction of any quasi-judicial body and other special cases in the inter Finally, we go to the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Trial Court, the Municipal Trial Court in cities, the Municipal Trial Courts, or the Municipal Circuit Trial Courts. Now, the exclusive original jurisdiction of the MTC, METC, MCTC, etc. The first one, where the value of personal property, estate, or amount of demand does not exceed 300,000 pesos outside of Metro Manila, or does not exceed 400,000 pesos in Metro Manila, exclusive of interest, damages of whatever kind, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, and costs in the following cases. Civil action, probate proceedings, test state or intestate, provisional remedies in proper cases. However, however, class, just take note of our discussion on the jurisdiction of the regional trial court with respect to these types of cases, as this is also applicable in the discussion in the municipal trial court. Now, the Municipal Trial Court also has jurisdiction over forcible entry and unlawful detainer cases, irrespective of the assessed value of the real property. The MTC, MCTC, METC, etc. also has exclusive original jurisdiction over all civil actions involving Title II or possession of real property or any interest therein where the assessed value of the property or interest therein does not exceed 20,000 outside of Metro Manila or does not exceed 50,000 pesos in Metro Manila. And also the MTC, etc. has exclusive original jurisdiction over the inclusion and exclusion of voters as provided in the Omnibus Election Code Section 49 thereof. The Municipal Trial Court, Municipal Circuit Trial Court, METC, etc., also has special jurisdiction. The MTC has special jurisdiction over petitions for writ of habeas corpus or applications for bail in criminal cases, in criminal cases, in the absence of all regional trial court judges in the province or city. The MTC likewise has delegated jurisdiction, precisely delegated jurisdiction of first level courts assigned by the Supreme Court to hear and decide cadastral and land registration cases covering lots where there is no controversy or opposition, or if there is, or if the lot is contested, the value of which does not exceed 100,000. This was discussed earlier. The significance of this is that the MTC decisions in these types of cadastral and land registration cases are appealable in the same manner as RTC decisions. So you do not appeal it with the RTC, but appeal it with the Court of Appeals, even though the Court of Origin is the Municipal Trial Court. Now, the final discussion in jurisdiction would be the payment of docket fees. Why is this important? Because the rule in jurisdiction is that when an action is filed, the filing itself must be accompanied by proof of payment of the requisite docket and filing fees. Now the fees must be paid because the court acquires jurisdiction over the case only upon payment or only upon proper payment of the prescribed legal fees as provided in the case of Manchester versus Court of Appeal, May 7, 1987. Precisely, payment of the full amount of docket fees is mandatory and jurisdictional. Again, class, payment of the full amount of the docket fees is mandatory and jurisdictional. When the complaint is filed and the prescribed fees are paid, the action is deemed commenced. The court acquires jurisdiction of the person, the plaintiff, and the running of the prescriptive period of the action is interrupted. However, the rule in Manchester was relaxed by the Supreme Court in some cases. 
in which payment of the fee within a reasonable time or a reasonable period, but not beyond the prescriptive period for the filing of the action, was permitted. Now, from the foregoing, there are two rules here. Two rules. The first one, lovingly coined as the Manchester Rule, is derived from the case of Manchester versus Court of Appeals, GR number 75919, May 7, 1987. It provides that any defect in the original pleading resulting in underpayment of the docket fees cannot be cured by amendment, such as by the reduction of the claim as for all legal purposes. There is no original complaint over which the court has acquired jurisdiction. In Manchester, the fees, the full payment, of the amount of docket fees is mandatory and jurisdictional. Again, when the complaint is filed and the prescribed fees are paid, the action is being commenced. However, this rule was relaxed in the case of Sun Insurance versus Asuncion, GR number 79937, February 13, 1989 when the Supreme Court held that while the payment of prescribed docket fees is a jurisdictional requirement, even its non-payment at the time of filing does not automatically cause the dismissal of the case, as long as the fee is paid within the applicable prescriptive or regulatory period. This is applicable more so when the party involved demonstrates a willingness to abide by the rules prescribing such payment. Thus, when the insufficient filing fees were initially paid, by the plaintiffs and there was no intention to defraud the government, the Manchester rule does not apply. Now, a question may be posed. What rule would you apply? The Manchester ruling or the ruling in Sun Life Insurance versus Asuncion? Again, when do you apply the Manchester or the doctrine in the case of Manchester versus Court of Appeals or the sun, the doctrine as prescribed in Sun Insurance versus Asuncion. You have first, you have to first determine if there was a deliberate, willful, and intentional refusal, avoidance, or evasion to pay the filing fee. If there was deliberate refusal or evasion to pay the prescribed docket fees in full, then you apply the strict interpretation of the Manchester rule such that if there is no full payment then the court acquires no jurisdiction and it cannot be cured by the subsequent payment. And as such, the case must be dismissed. Corollary there too. You apply the ruling in Sun Life Insurance or Sun Insurance versus Asuncion if there is no deliberate, willful and, del willful and intentional refusal, avoidance or invasion to pay the full filing fee. The insufficiency of payment was brought about without bad faith. Now in this instance, the court acquires jurisdiction even though the payment of the docket fees was not full and the court should not dismiss the case. However, the court will have to issue an order to pay the prescribed filing fee. However, it should be noted that the Supreme Court, in the case of Heirs of Dragon versus Manila Banking Corporation, GR number 205068, March 6, 2018, the Honorable Supreme Court held that notwithstanding the ruling in Sun Insurance Office, it must be emphasized that payment of filing fees in full at the time the initiatory pleading or application is filed is still the general rule. Exceptions that grant liberality for insufficient payment are strictly construed against the filing party. Moreover, as I have discussed earlier, the filing party must show that there was no intention to defraud the government of the appropriate filing fees due it. Should there be a finding that the filing party intended to conceal the amount of its claims to pay a smaller amount of docket fees, 
demonstrating an intent to defraud the court, what it is owed, then the doctrine in Manchester Development Corporation, not San Insurance Office, shall apply. That concludes a rather lengthy discussion on jurisdiction as it relates to civil cases. On the next recording, I shall discuss actions and causes of action under Rule 2. Thank you for listening. I sincerely hope that the discussion in this recording has been helpful or at the very least has been informative. Thank you.